Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Grand Rounds. I'm here to introduce Dr. Palacy, who's a professor of microbiology and the chair of the Department of Microbiology at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. His research is in RNA-containing viruses with special emphasis on influenza viruses, including the establishment of the first genetic maps for influenza A, B, and C. Dr. Palazzi identified the function of several viral genes and defined the mechanism of neuraminidase inhibitors, which are now FDA-approved antivirals, and pioneered a technique of reverse genetics used to study the viral pathogenicity of the 1918 pandemic influenza virus. In recent years, most of the efforts by Dr. Palacy and by his collaborators at Mount Sinai, Adolfo Garcia Sastre and Florian Kramer, have been directed at developing a universal influenza virus vaccine. Since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, there has been a shift in his research toward work on SARS-CoV-2. In collaboration with Adolfo Garcia Sastre and Florian Kramer, Dr. Palacy is now focusing on the development of a COVID-19 vaccine for low and middle income, income countries. Dr. Palacy is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, a member of the National Academy of Medicine, a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and a fellow of the National Academy of Inventors. A very warm welcome to Dr. Palacy. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Levin, for this very generous introduction. I will uh, talk briefly today about vaccines and have it divided into three sort of uh, chapters. First, I want to remind ourselves that viral vaccines really work. Then I want to switch over to the success story of the COVID-19 vaccines as far as we uh, go after 18 months. And then finally, as Dr. Levin has already uh, mentioned, we are developing at Mount Sinai a COVID-19 vaccine, which is aiming at uh, vaccination in low and middle income countries. And that is a Newcastle disease virus vector SARS coronavirus 2 spike vaccine. This is a mouthful, but you will see uh, what, what it is. First, viral vaccines really work. And uh, we all know uh, we have vaccine preventable diseases. And the first one is smallpox because it's the only, the only virus which we have eradicated. And I will say two sec seconds about this. We also know we have fantastic measles vaccine, we have a fantastic mumps vaccine, poliomyelitis vaccine, cervical carcinoma, human papillomavirus vaccine, chickenpox and zoster. Uh, on that list, probably the least successful one is influenza, but you know, that's not an easy uh, one. And we haven't, I haven't listed here uh, four other vaccines because we have about 11, uh, 12, 13 uh, human vaccines. I have not mentioned the rubella vaccine, which is, I think, a fantastic vaccine. The older ones probably remember that we had at Mount Sinai here in, in pediatrics, we had on Thursday afternoons rubella clinics. And this was just heart-wrenching. We, uh, we saw going up and down in the elevators, these poor kids. Uh, I mean, I don't want to explain. It's all gone. Unfortunately, uh, the uh, poor patients, most of them have died, but there were no new cases. So we don't even have a rubella clinic anymore. Uh, also great success, the rubella vaccine. We have hepatitis A vaccines, hepatitis B vaccines, and rotavirus vaccines, not on this list. So as I said, we have about 11, 12, and they really work. So let me just remind us, and you all know from, uh, from um, high school, that smallpox, uh, has a long history. Uh, we all know that uh, 1796, uh, Edward Jenner in London actually vaccinated uh, one, a, a young child, uh, Jim Phipps, and uh, we uh, sort of started the uh, era of smallpox vaccination. It took uh, 200 years, however, from 1796 to 1977, that we were able to eradicate and uh, get rid of smallpox. And that was, uh, the last case was in Somalia in 1977. And in 1980, the WHO declared uh, the world free of smallpox. So this is a really fantastic success. And uh, I think we should be all happy about this. Uh, it, it was a terrible, it, it was a terrible disease. Uh, what few people know actually is that smallpox 
caused in the 20th century, in the last century, quite a lot of deaths. And uh, this has to do with the early part of the century, within the first 20 years of the 20th century, namely from 1900 to 1920, it is estimated that more than 300 million people died of smallpox in that brief period, brief period of, in this first quarter, uh, first 20 years of the 20th century. And then you have on the left side here some numbers. We, we all know World War, World War I, World War II, terrible. But uh, compared to the cost in lives of what smallpox did in the, in the first 20 years, uh, it's really, uh, you can see this amazing uh, impact. Uh, the next slide is actually one which uh, is, uh, has also some uh, interesting um, uh, information. Uh, not everyone was excited uh, in, uh, at the end of the eight, of 1790 about the vaccine. And in 1802, uh, there is a cartoon uh, which shows a physician in the middle uh, who vaccinates uh, one of the patients. And then all around, you can see that these patients are growing uh, cow limbs, cow horns, etc. And this uh, has a, a refers to that the smallpox vaccine was uh, uh, made from cowpox, from uh, pox viruses which were infecting cows. And uh, just six years later, on, in this cartoon, it is shown how everyone uh, gets all of these side effects and I just want to remind you that we have 30%, 20% in this country who also believe that we grow horns when we get uh, COVID-19 vaccines. Anyway, so this is just to show that this is really uh, something which is not new. These anti-vaxxers, they have been here before. Uh, I want to re remind us that uh, vaccines really work. And this, these are the numbers for measles virus. So we have the 50 countries here. And you can see this black line uh, shows when the vaccine was introduced in the 60s, 1960s. And these uh, colored uh, squares show the number uh, in 1930, 1940, in Alaska, Wyoming, etc. And you can see after the vaccine is introduced, we all go to basically nothing. So this is a wonderful success of vaccines that uh, the number of measles cases in our 50 uh, states here uh, was dramatically reduced. And this was not only for measles virus, but it was also for mumps, wonderful. Uh, again, uh, after the vaccine introduced, it took a little bit longer, but basically mumps doesn't exist anymore. And even more important, I think we all still remember uh, that poliomyelitis was terrible. And after the introduction of the vaccine, uh, we also, uh, in essence, got rid of poliomyelitis. And I just want to show among the younger ones, you probably have not seen this. Uh, this is um, uh, in the words could have been uh, New York City, and those are the iron lungs. So these are mechanical ventilators which were used to um, help uh, mostly children, but also older people to actually uh, overcome uh, the uh, paralysis caused by poliomyelitis virus. What very few people know is that only 10 to maximum 20% of those who were put into, unfortunately had to uh, be put into iron lungs survive. So 80% died of uh, bacterial pneumonia, et cetera, uh, as a result of these iron lungs. So yes, uh, they were used, but uh, it was not a happy um, situation iron lungs. We don't see this anymore uh, after we have uh, obtained the poliomyelitis vaccine. So um, then uh, on this list of, of, the, of preventable, uh, vaccine, vaccine, or preventable diseases caused by vaccines, I should also mention uh, influenza. And the reason for that is we had this traumatic and traumatic 1918-1919 influenza uh, pandemic, and uh, the estimates are that between 50 to 100 million people died. And that was really in a very, very brief period of time between uh, November of, 20, of 1919 to about, I'm sorry, November 1918 to about February, March of 1919. 50 to 100 million people 
we had about only a third of uh, the people at the, uh, of what we have right now. So this was an amazing uh, uh, pandemic, the 1918, 1919 pandemic. And uh, we should also uh, have a slide which reminds us of COVID-19 here. And that is a uh, village in Alaska all the way to the north. And uh, they were affected by the 1918, 1919 pandemic. And what you can see here is that the young ones survived, but the parents and grandparents didn't. And that shows that the virus, when it infects older people, is more severe and causes more death and more disease than in young people. And that's something similar we see with COVID-19. For the young ones, it is a more manageable disease as compared to the old ones. In this picture from photograph from 1918, 1919, we can clearly see uh, that that was also the case for the 1918-1919 pandemic uh, in those villages which had not seen any, any influenza before. And when this new pandemic virus hit, uh, the young ones survived and the old ones, uh, unfortunately, uh, we lost a lot of lives there. So that's quite something interesting. Again, that the older people are more affected than the younger people, as we can see with COVID-19. So uh, this was just to remind us that vaccines really work, but we have to vaccinate. Vaccines alone, just because they are there don't help, we have to vaccinate. And that brings us to COVID-19. And you all know here, and these are data from uh, the end of September, we have uh, over 4 million deaths. We have uh, numerous cases and uh, even in the United States, the numbers are terrible. We are close to 700,000 deaths attributed to COVID-19 and untold numbers of cases. So that's really something which uh, uh, is the, uh, the numbers are increasing. We all know about this and uh, it's, it's a terrible disease. It's a terrible disease. And uh, also what is important is that these variants, and they are variants of interest, variants of concern, uh, are popping up. And I just show one slide here, and we just looked, uh, this is like uh, middle of September, so we have this brown column, and those are the Delta variants, which within a period of three months have, have overtaken the uh, kind of coronavirus, South coronavirus 2, which is circulating in the United States. And you can see here that this Delta variant has been extraordinarily successful. Uh, right now, I, uh, I think, I want to say 98%, nothing is perfect, nothing is 100%, but it has really taken over. And uh, it is certainly more transmissible, <laughs> whether it is more uh, causing disease, I think, don't think it's still yet that clear. But uh, we will see that I think uh, the vaccines are actually pretty good, even against this uh, Delta variant, which is circulating. I would like to say that no one really can tell. I mean, I'm a long field, a long time in this field. No one can really tell whether uh, we will have um, uh, another variant popping up in one month or three months. I mean, I think those predictions are all very, very difficult to make. Now. Uh, also, we know in uh, New York City, we had uh, uh, these uh, terrible um, waves of uh, COVID-19. And even today, we have this uh, third uh, um, wave here of uh, the cases and uh, uh, total uh, cases have sort of I think uh, in October are coming down again, but uh, it's really not, not an easy situation. Okay, so uh, this brings us to the COVID-19 vaccines. And just start out, starting out with, they are fantastic vaccines and uh, they have been developed in the last uh, 18 months really. And uh, they go in essence, in, uh, they come in two flavors. The first flavor are the so-called mRNA vaccines, and we all have heard of it. Basically, mRNA is injected, and this mRNA is translated 
into proteins and the proteins of the protein of the surface of the uh, COVID-19 virus of SARS coronavirus 2 And there are two famous companies, Pfizer and Moderna, basically the same, they're using slightly different um, uh, procedures, but it's an mRNA, uh, which is packaged in lipids and then is injected. And Pfizer has a lower dose, 30 microgram uh, per dose of RNA, Moderna has 100 microgram. And then the second uh, flavor is the viral vector vaccines. And there, the one which is really sort of uh, most successful and the most vaccines in the world have been given uh, by uh, 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 the flavor of the, or the vaccine is actually a uh, adenovirus vector vaccine. And there we have in this country, FDA approved the Johnson & Johnson, but also AstraZeneca in Europe and then Sputnik in in Russia, and then also uh, several companies in China are making these adenovirus-driven uh, uh, vector vaccines. So we have the two major forms, mRNA vaccines, and then adenovirus, whereby the adenovirus is a virus into which the gene for the protein of the SARS coronavirus 2 surface glycoprotein is uh, uh, in, is built in, and when one gets this vaccine, uh, then we make uh, the protein against this, or the, we make protein of the uh, SARS coronavirus 2, and then we make antibodies and get protected. And then there are minor ones, uh, inactivated vaccine or a recombinant protein vaccine, but they have not really, I, I think about 90% of all the vaccines which have been administered in the world are mRNA vaccines and then the uh, adenovirus vector vaccines. And I will talk about, uh, as I mentioned already, of our, uh, about our approach, which uses also a vector, but it is not adenovirus, it is Newcastle disease, and I will talk about it. So uh, this is what uh, is happening. And um, we are trying to make a vaccine, which is uh, cheap, uh, it would be for low and middle income countries, and also uh, is uh, obviously we all, all want the safe vaccine, that's uh, the number one, but also that it, it can be uh, stored uh, much easier. The mRNA vaccines have to be stored at minus 40 degrees centigrade, minus 80 degrees centigrade, which makes it very expensive, uh, depending on the country. One dose costs about $30 in terms of the mRNA vaccines. We are trying to make uh, a vaccine which where the, the one dose would be under $1, maybe even 30 cents only, depends on how uh, many doses are being made. And uh, this is a COVID-19 vaccine, which is based on Newcastle disease virus. And this is a uh, virus that we briefly described. And uh, this is uh, a collaboration of three groups here at Mount Sinai, uh, Florian Kramer's group, but also the Theosostis group and my own. And uh, we are trying to do the following. Uh, Newcastle disease virus is a um, avian virus and it belongs to the family of paramyxoviruses. It has negative sense RNA. And this is just interesting. I mean, for those of, of uh, you who know we have a lot of interest over many decades uh, in influenza viruses, and that's also a negative sense of an A virus. So when coronaviruses uh, came about, uh, we were uh, having a, had a lot of experience with all of these negative sense of an A virus, including Newcastle disease virus. And that is a virus which infects um, domestic and wild birds, but in humans, it is... Uh, innocuous, it really doesn't do much. And uh, in very rare cases, it can cause a little bit of conjunctivitis if large doses are, uh, uh, infect uh, a human. So, uh, and then there are different strains. And the reason are different strains is because all the chicken in the world are always vaccinated against Newcastle disease. And uh, uh, that means billions of doses are vaccinated against chicken. And there are different strains like the Hitchner, La Soda, uh, and uh, these are 
attenuated, mean, meaning they are not causing disease, they are protecting chicken uh, worldwide. And we are actually using the Lasoda strain, which is an avian virus, as a vector in humans to express the SARS coronavirus uh, to surface glycoprotein. So this is really uh, a complicated slide in a way. And if we start here on the left side, uh, we have the genome of this Newcastle disease virus in black. And uh, this is the virus which infects uh, chicken, also turkeys, etc. But uh, if one uses the Lasoda strain, then one can protect chicken and turkey and, and other uh, birds against uh, our Newcastle disease virus. And we have, by genetic engineering, we have introduced into uh, this genome, which is black, uh, the a spike of the SARS coronavirus too. So that is uh, the following happens when this uh, blue containing Newcastle disease virus infects humans, uh, all the proteins of the uh, Newcastle disease virus are expressed, but most importantly, the blue one is expressed, and uh, that is the spike protein. And uh, there's a lot of genetic engineering behind it. We have anchored it in the surface, in the membrane of the Newcastle disease virus by giving it the transmembrane region, cytoplasmic tail of the of an F protein. We have also introduced uh, six prolines to stabilize the virus, and also there is a cleavage site which makes the virus more um, virulent, and that has the spike protein of the SARS coronavirus. We have also uh, changed so that it cannot really cause any problems in humans. So we have eliminated uh, the polybasic cleavage site. So these are minor details, and we make a virus which looks like a virus, but it has on its surface, blue here, the SARS coronavirus to spike, and we can make that in, and we can grow that in embryonated eggs, like most of the influenza virus vaccines, which are produced worldwide. And uh, this uh, vaccine production in eggs using the global influenza virus vaccine production capacity allows us to make large quantities of that, of that virus, which when injected into humans, either as a live intranasal one, which uh, is uh, giving mucosal immunity or in, in the inactivated form uh, in the muscular route and uh, it induces systemic antibodies. And by that, uh, we can get protected against the uh, SARS coronavirus. So this is the principle. Uh, we have done a lot of biological, biochemical analysis of this vaccine uh, and uh, without really going into all of the details, let me uh, skip uh, this slide here. It just, we have done a lot of uh, biochemistry. We understand this virus and very important, it is stable. Uh, this, for example, on the right side shows its passage one, two, three, four. And what we are looking at is at this uh, spike protein expression and it's very, very stable. So we know quite a lot about it. And also we have done a lot of preclinical uh, um, experiments. So preclinical means we take uh, a mouse, so we take a hamster, and then we vaccinate uh, this group. Uh, in this case, we have N of eight, and we have 10 different groups. And what you can see here is that, and, and they have, uh, these mice get uh, an adjuvant, but they don't get adjuvant, you get one microgram of those, 0.1 microgram, 0.03. So all of this, and I would like you just to look at the lower right, um, at the, um, figure of the day five lung titers. And what you can see is that animals which were protected with immunization with the wild type Newcastle disease virus actually make, uh, after challenge, quite a lot of virus between 10, 10 to the four and 10 to the five. But all the other groups uh, which we have in terms of immunized uh, animals, not a single one of those uh, has any titer. So this is really the low doses. And in this case, we are used and inactivated, not inactive. We had inactivated it. One can do this with formaldehyde or with uh, uh, beta propylactone. We have significantly reduced the viral titer in the lungs in a dose dependent manner. So this is really a, a very, was very exciting. We have hamster experiments. I just uh, show this one here. And in all of these experiments, we find that 
basically, I can protect uh, every mouse in the world and every hamster in the world against uh, COVID-19. But as you know, uh, mice are not men, and therefore we have to really uh, be very sure that this uh, works. Uh, the, I mentioned already that we have a lot of variants popping up. Right now, we have the Delta variant being the majority of the strain. But uh, as you know, we have also uh, the UK variant, we have the Brazilian variant, uh, we have uh, uh, now variants in South Africa. And uh, so these variants are causing uh, uh, concern. And uh, we would like to know whether uh, our vaccine is also protecting against these variants. And that is, I think, uh, a, a slide I want to show here. And there we have these three figures. And uh, the first point, several mice obviously, is uh, it was vaccinated with the NDV and uh, the construct is hexaprolines and uh, it is a, a surface glycoprotein of the COVID-19 virus expressing construct. And then the second uh, point is uh, we are using the wild type. And as you can see here, when we vaccinate with the wild type, uh, the uh, mice get challenged with the Wuhan strain, that's WA1. And uh, we can see that uh, these mice are all coming down with disease, having a lot of virus of Wuhan virus into the six in their lungs. But those who be, uh, mice which were vaccinated are actually all protected and uh, have uh, Basically, under, so this is like ten a million fold less virus. So you can see uh, these mice are very well protected. But then we also ask, what happens if we are checking, the, if we are challenging these mice, not with the original Wuhan strain, uh, which is in our vaccine, but um, how good is it against the Brazilian uh, challenge virus against the South African? Challenge? And there we can see again that the control is about 10 to the five in those which, uh, mice which got the negative, uh, with just wild type, uh, we can get 10 to the five depending uh, 10 to the six. Uh, these challenge viruses don't all go uh, equally well in, in mice, so that's why you have here 10 to the six and here's a little bit less. But what is important when we vaccinate uh, with the Wuhan vaccine, then we can see we get still a 10 to the 1,000 fold, 10,000 fold reduction in Tyler uh, if these mice were vaccinated and then challenged with these variants of concern. So uh, this is obviously, I say again, mice are not men, but uh, what we can see here is really that uh, the variants uh, which we use for challenging our vaccinated mice are uh, Basically, uh, the vaccine is really good against these challenge viruses. And I think we, we, we can, nothing is 100%, but I think we can say that uh, our vaccine should also work against these variants, not only against the original Wuhan strain. So that I think is an important detail for our from data from our preclinical experiments. So in summary then, what are the advantages of the NDV SARS coronavirus uh, vaccine? It is very safe. I didn't go into this. Uh, I didn't really uh, talk about the highly immune, uh, these constructs are very highly immunogenic. I did mention that we have both live and inactivated platforms. So far, only inactivated, or th there is no live mucosal immune inducing vaccine on the market yet. So we would be. Uh, the first one, we can just sort of spray this into the nose and get a uh, immune response in the upper respiratory tract. That's where the virus really gets into our systems in humans. Uh, as I said, the uh, vaccine can be produced using influenza virus vaccines, uh, regular ones, and uh, they are, it can be easily uh, scalable, uh, a, a billion uh, Doses are made actually every year in terms of influenza virus vaccine, and that is done in, the, in, a, in a three month period. These companies are usually, and factories are usually empty for another nine months, and they could easily be used to make the NDV SARS coronavirus um, 
a spike of, uh, vaccine. Point number four, uh, we have no issues with vector immunity in humans. The adenovirus uh, driven ones, sometimes people have antibodies against these particular adenoviruses and then the vector is actually not as good uh, as it would be in people uh, with, uh, which do not have, as in our case, have no antibodies against nucleus of disease virus. And then, as I mentioned briefly already, our vaccine is stable at two to four degrees centigrade, which is our kitchen refrigeration temperature, and uh, does not have to be kept at minus 40 or minus 80 degrees. So there is a very low cost uh, cold chain and we also believe that uh, even though these side effects are very rare in terms of blood clotting, I don't think because we have a different species as a vector rather than a human virus, uh, we do not have to worry about these uh, clotting problems. But uh, the ultimate jury is only after a million people have been vaccinated. And then we can make these vaccines also with these uh, a completely different variants of concern. We can make a coronavirus in the Newcastle disease virus spike uh, expressing vaccine with that of the uh, Delta variant, with that of the uh, Brazilian variant, UK variant, South African variant. And so we are doing all of this and we will see whether it is necessary or whether the Wuhan uh, vaccine, uh, which is in all the approved vaccines so far, uh, would be sufficient. I think the jury is also on this still out whether these variants are really that different uh, so that we have to think about a different vaccine. But uh, we can uh, certainly make this with our NDV vaccine and we are doing this in the laboratory and checking it out. So uh, this is really uh, in terms of preclinical what we can say, but we also have now uh, very early uh, data from clinical trials. We have uh, in five different countries, we have clinical trials going on. The one I will talk a little bit about and give some data uh, is uh, the data from Thailand. And there uh, we have about uh, uh, 200 people in phase one. Uh, the phase two has already finished, but we don't have any data yet. But the uh, data which are from Thailand, I will briefly on two slides show, uh, they are very uh, promising and uh, they have been published about uh, 10 days ago in, uh, in uh, um, Med Archives. So that's the, um, a non-reviewed journal, which is, some, or which is frequently used for work uh, in the COVID-19 field, field. We have also a, a phase one and phase two trials going on in Vietnam. Uh, phase one has been completed, the, inter the results are being written up. And uh, we have also in Brazil, uh, where we have uh, uh, more than 400 people, and they are also uh, trying to make phase two and uh, thinking about phase three. And then Mexico is another country where we have actually live virus, and uh, they are the interim results are being written up right now. And then we have also a phase one trial going on in Mount Sinai, but thanks to our FDA, we are clearly the uh, slowest one. And uh, uh, let me tell you, nothing is easy. Okay, so uh, in terms of the preliminary data, we have different groups here. Uh, one microgram of spike uh, uh, adjuvant, three micrograms of spike plus adjuvant, 10 micrograms of spike placebo. And um, these data in Thailand are very, very uh, Promising. So this is the last uh, data slide I want to go through. Uh, it is, I think, uh, very uh, compelling. And so what one looks here is uh, by ELISA is, is at the uh, antibody titers, which, uh, which are binding to the uh, cells. And that is the ACE2 receptor, or uh, we have a neutralizing activity. So these data are not from us, but they are uh, taken done with the zero from patients who got the vaccine in Thailand, and then it is shipped to a company uh, in, in um, Canada, which is actually doing these assays. So uh, this is really done by third parties. And if you look at the last uh, uh, set of points here, 
So this is a, a, a human convalescence serum of people who have been vaccinated and they have all kinds of titles here and the average is down here. And the same here in terms of neutralizing activity. And then we have these different groups I was uh, uh, mentioning before, of one microgram, three microgram and 10 micrograms and uh, plus or minus the adjuvant. And what you can see here is, let's look for the highest dose of 10 microgram. Uh, we have after the first dose, uh, it's, in, it's a minor increase in those neutralizing antibodies, but as we go uh, towards um, the second, and that's 43 days after uh, starting of the experiment in, in humans here, the human experiment, we can clearly see that this is a, a very interesting um, uh, increase in neutralizing titers here. And uh, it shows that it's at least tenfold higher than normal human convalescence here, uh, the titer are, and uh, this is very uh, promising and is uh, comparable to what the titers for neutralizing activity or binding activity on this side here uh, as a result of vaccination with the uh, Pfizer or the Moderna uh, vaccine. So we are very happy about this. Obviously, uh, we are talking here about uh, uh, 30 uh, cohorts in each of these groups, but uh, the important thing is here, both in terms of the neutralizing activity as well as the binding activity, we have uh, much higher, ten, at least tenfold higher uh, titers than uh, human convalescent people who have been infected naturally with the uh, COVID-19 virus. And uh, we can see here that um, probably the um, adjuvant per se is probably not that much better, but uh, uh, we don't know about the breadth of the, these antibodies. So the jury is also still out whether an adjuvant is uh, uh, preferable or not, but these are the data and we are actually very happy uh, with these data in terms of um, showing neutralizing activity and also another uh, antibody uh, test, which is just measuring the binding to the receptor on those cells. So that's really where we are. We are quite happy uh, with the data and uh, they have been published, as I said, about 10 days ago. And uh, I want to slow to, to close really with saying that uh, COVID-19 is really a pandemic of the unvaccinated. The vaccines are fantastically uh, effective. I think uh, they are obviously are very expensive and we are trying to um, provide some relief in terms of only about, I think, 1% of the world population in low and middle income countries have been vaccinated. And part of that is that the cost of these Moderna and Pfizer vaccines is very, very high. And we hope that there is uh, some help in terms of the uh, price and also the uh, uh, ease of uh, producing this in terms of uh, having another uh, COVID-19 vaccine. So that's really uh, what I wanted to uh, discuss with you. And I hope we have some time to answer some questions. And this is again, uh, a collaboration of the three laboratories, three groups at Mount Sinai, uh, Florian Kramer's laboratory, Garcia Sostos laboratory, my own, my own. And then we have collaborators that couldn't really talk about all of the data uh, which we have, but uh, we are getting support from the, uh, mostly from the NIH, and that is really something which we have to acknowledge. We are also getting uh, support from philanthropy through Mount Sinai. I'm very happy it would not have been possible to be uh, at the stage where we are right now. And then uh, we are also uh, working, getting some money from Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And uh, the vaccines we have talked about, which are are now given to people in Thailand, in Vietnam, in Brazil, and in Mexico, are uh, all local companies, local uh, influenza vaccine companies, and they produce our vaccine, the Newcastle disease virus vector, uh, COVID-19 vaccine. And uh, let me close with this, and I'm happy to answer some questions. Thank you, Dr. Palazzi. That was terrific. Uh, we do have some comment and questions in the chat, which I can help with. Let me get up to the top here. Hold on. 
Um, Dr. Uh, Dobisovac's comment that she had taken care of patients um, on an iron, with iron lung when she first started. Um, so there's a question, um, are older patients more affected than the younger because of the toxic hyperimmune reaction due to more cross-reactivity? Okay, the, uh, okay, if I understand the question is why are young people uh, easier to weather a COVID-19 infection or as in, in, uh, in, in Alaska, uh, when there is no flu and a new influenza viral strain comes into the uh, village in uh, the north of, of uh, Alaska, why is it that the older people are more affected than younger ones? And it's not, it's a very good question. Uh, one of the explanations is that the interferon, which is the innate immunity uh, branch, so it's not antibodies, so it's interferon, that young people have a better interferon response. So if young people get infected, their interferon, their antiviral, their endogenous antiviral uh, uh, pathways are better than even of a 20 year old, 30, 30, 40, and 50. So that's sort of the, uh, if you have a new, completely new virus where there is no prior exposure and partial antibody responses, it is thought that young people have a better interferon response and therefore are less likely to have serious side effects. Uh, it's, um, it's a very good question, and I think the answer is not yet completely clear, but uh, it is, and the same is true with measles. Uh, the, the American Indians, as you well know, when the a bad white man came into the Americas, uh, he brought measles along. And again, there, the young people were able to. Uh, overcome measles infections, but the parents and grandparents' generation was wiped out. And that was really the reason why uh, the American Indians really uh, were conquered, not because uh, Christopher Columbus had a, had a machine gun. It was really the diseases, and there the uh, measles, mumps, uh, smallpox, and the older population was much more severe than in the younger ones. Gotcha. The, there's another a question. Uh, have you tried to make a vaccine with the NDV technology to kill cancers in mice? <laughs> uh, it's very interesting you, you um, bring that up. Uh, Garcia Sost and myself, we have actually uh, had uh, a, a program uh, using Newcastle disease virus as an oncolytic virus, and it has been actually uh, bought, licensed by. Um, by Merck and is now in phase one, phase two studies, but they keep us really out of it and they uh, don't want us to know really what they are doing, but this is a Newcastle disease virus based oncolytic virus. Uh, we have put in an IL-12 to make it more immunogenic. So we have tinkered with it a little bit and hope this is better than the other uh, oncolytic viruses which are on the market already. But uh, yes, it's ongoing and Merck has a program phase one, phase two with our Mount Sinai oncolytic Newcastle disease virus. Great. Um, there are a couple of questions here. How different are the live versus inactivated formulations in immunogenicity and neutralizing titers? Yeah, okay, very good point. So the live one is, can be given through the nose. So it is, uh, as you probably know, there are there, is, there are live influenza virus vaccines, particularly for the young ones, it's flu mist, and it is sprayed into the nose. And what that does, it replicates uh, one cycle, one and a half cycles, maybe not, not much, not enough to get disease, but enough to induce uh, the production of the sars coronavirus spike protein and uh, induce an antibody response. So the mucosal uh, and uh, IgA response can only be obtained in a good way by live virus vaccines. The killed ones are obviously uh, they are inactivated, not inactive again. They are really made uh, to uh, non, uh, just provide the protein and uh, they are very tried and true. I mean, polio vaccines we have live and we have killed, we have influenza virus live and killed. So uh, they, are, they have different properties, meaning one can be more 
uh, inducing a mucosal immunity, the others more systemic. And I think uh, depending who it is, children, older, we have to find out what is the best uh, uh, formulation. And then the addition to that was, uh, do you think the T cell responses with the live vaccine would increase its efficacy? Okay, yes. I, I have to sort of have a conflict of interest here because I'm more of a, a humoral uh, in vaccines in terms of flu and in terms of COVID-19. I just feel that uh, probably the humoral response is more important, but clearly you are absolutely right. Uh, the uh, person who asked that question is that in the case of a live uh, influenza virus vaccine, a live other uh, zoster vaccine, et cetera, one makes T cell responses, uh, which can, which are not as pronounced and as good in the killed one, in the inactivated one. Mm -hmm. uh, again, if you don't believe that much in uh, T cells, and I don't want to say it's humoral 90% and T cells 10%, you are not so concerned about uh, not having a T cell response, but there are other colleagues of mine who would say it's very important to have a T cell response. Very good question. Gotcha. Uh, another interesting question. You mentioned that this approach is easily adaptable to modify for different strains. So do you think that there is promise for a universal coronavirus vaccine using this approach? Okay, so I have briefly mentioned that we are in the same three characters, Katia Zastre, Kramer and myself. We are also making a universal influenza virus vaccine. And there the idea is to use the conserved a domain of the surface glycoprotein and making a vaccine against that or making a vaccine with that. And uh, then people say, okay, well, you, you seem to be successful with flu. Why don't you do this with uh, COVID-19 or with HIV? And let me say, tell you, uh, it's apples and oranges. There is no real, uh, yes, we can make different uh, variants of the COVID-19 vaccine, but uh, it will be specific for this variant. We have not found a domain of the S protein, of the, of the sars cov S protein, which is conserved among all of these different variants or uh, would really uh, lend itself to make a universal COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, unfortunately, it's, it's really apples and oranges. With flu, we hope it works. I don't think it will work easily with, uh, with uh, HIV. And also uh, there are people who are trying it, but I don't think we are there yet. A universal uh, vaccine against COVID-19. Right now, we really have only specific vaccines, Wuhan strain, South African strain, Brazilian strain, et cetera. And then there's a question asking, do the previously infected people need to be immunized? Okay, very, very good question. And um, so we really don't know how long the immunity, the protection lasts after a regular uh, natural in, uh, COVID-19 infection. So in a way, from the data, and there are very good uh, data from Mount Sinai, from our clinical area, uh, Viviana Simon and uh, we really know it. We, we have a lot of information on that. And if people who have received the vaccine get uh, a dose, either Pfizer or Moderna, the titles against the uh, S protein go up dramatically, go up dramatically. So I think it's a good thing. Uh, and I think it will be, there are no side effects as far as I know uh, in people who have had the vaccine and then get a booster with a Moderna, Pfizer, or even um, Johnson Johnson. So I would say, I think this is good policy. I think from all I know, I think it will only increase the protection. And uh, I think this is a very good uh, strategy. And I feel we, uh, we cannot lose by doing this. There, there's a question that links to that. And that is, is there any data around how long after vaccination with the Newcastle-based vaccine a person is protected for? No, these are, no unf unfortunately not. Uh, these are all uh, phase one trials. And I, I, I think I mentioned we have 42 days after the first vaccine. 
uh, after uh, the trial starts. So we really don't have data. Uh, it has to be, um, this is something we have to wait. However, from the Johnson & Johnson data and uh, um, the other adenovirus-driven vector vaccines, I think they are off, they, uh, it goes down, but we don't know how fast and how whether people who have very low titers or no titers after vaccination uh, are still protected. All of this is still not completely clear. There's a question Dr. Lazy asking if you can comment on the tablets that Merck is making and whether it binds to the spike protein. Okay, it's wonderful. I, I only know what you uh, read, what we all read. I think it sounds very good. It's actually, it was developed as an influenza antiviral. And uh, it is against the RNA dependent RNA polymerase of influenza viruses, but it appears to have also good effect uh, on SARS coronavirus. Um, SARS coronaviruses. So this is a drug, and uh, clearly it, uh, it has uh, its place. I think uh, we need vaccine. We need vaccinations of uh, hopefully 100% of the population. But uh, in those people who cannot take the vaccine or uh, have uh, uh, some religious reasons or whatever, I think uh, the uh, development of an antiviral and the data so far look very, very good. I know the uh, developer of this, Plamper at, uh, uh, at Emory in Atlanta is a very, very good guy. He's really in this field for uh, many, many 20, 30 years. So I think this is not a hyped up uh, a re a report. I, I, I have high hopes that these antivirals against COVID-19 virus uh, really will be good. Great. Dr. Liu wanted to point out to us that the study in Mount Sinai will um, be used um, as a booster for adults who are previously immunized and, and congratulating you on a great talk, Dr. Glazy. Another question is, how much of an IgA response is seen with the mRNA spike vaccines versus IgG response? Okay, uh, the, with the inactivated one, it's basically impossible to measure IgA. And uh, we have in preclinical data, we have shown in mice and also in uh, hamsters that uh, our live virus vaccine induces an IgA response, but we don't know how good it is, how long lasting it is, how how much better, or what uh, is IgA makes 50% protection, IgG another 50, or is it 80, 20? All of that is not, is not, not yet clear. Gotcha. Um, the human immunogenicity data look very promising. Are they, are, are they from one dose? And how does the single dose compare with single dose of current vaccines? Uh, I think, okay, let me first, uh, one, one dose is certainly not optimal for either Pfizer nor Moderna nor uh, Johnson Johnson. And I think without having the data, I think it is fair to say that we would need our also with our vaccine, two doses. Gotcha. Um, there's a question around the J&J &J vaccine seems to have a much lower antibody response versus the mRNA. Do we know how much of the decreased effect is due to vector immunity versus materials or handling? It's handling. Yes, um, but again, these are all uh, antibody titers, ELISA uh, data. And they are not really, uh, maybe there are T cells which are not being measured that way, uh, uh, T cell immunity. I think we should uh, refrain of saying one is better than the other. I think uh, we, we, we don't, even though uh, millions of, uh, not millions, but uh, uh, tens of thousands of papers have been written at, uh, and are written about this. I think we should still wait and uh, it depends how you measure it and all of that. I would not uh, like to uh, see a condemnation of the Johnson Johnson vaccine as compared to the uh, mRNA vaccine. I think, we, I think they are very good right now. and uh, We cannot really differentiate to be, if I'm quite honest. Gotcha. Um. There was a question, a couple just popped in. Any data on the Novavax vaccine effectiveness? 
the data we have seen are very, very good. However, they have not been able to really produce large quantities. So it appears that the production of the Novavax uh, has challenges. And uh, the, the published data on the effectiveness of the vaccine are really superb, absolutely, maybe, <laughs> I want to be careful, uh, the titles are very, very high. Uh, but again, uh, we are now uh, in year, certainly a year after all of these um, uh, announcements were made, and we still don't have uh, an FDA approved F or even emergency approved uh, product from uh, uh, Novavax. But I think it's a legitimate uh, way of producing the uh, uh, the protein and uh, a le legitimate way of developing a vaccine. But again, I think this is another um, uh, error in our armamentarium for uh, vaccines against this terrible disease. Um, there's a rather grand question here that asks why only 10 pandemics in recorded history versus thousands of epidem epidemics. I don't know if you want to comment. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, a pandemic is only a big epidemic. Yeah? And uh, clearly, uh, if one has a virus, and I talk only about the viral uh, pandemics, if you have a virus which is very easily transmissible, then it can result into a pandemic. Uh, but again, um, some of those are a little bit less transmissible, some of these uh, uh, pathogens, and then you only have it epidemic instead of a pandemic, but it's really only a, a quantitation. I mean, the, if you have a big epidemic, uh, uh, then uh, people would really say, and it goes into several countries, not completely in every village in the world, uh, we have a pandemic. So uh, a big epidemic is a pandemic. Gotcha. Well, Dr. Palazzi, that, that gets all of our questions. Um, and we're just coming up on the 9.30 hours. So really wanted to thank you for sharing all your terrific work that you're doing and, and what a great Grand Rounds for us today. So thank you very much for a great talk. Thank you. Have a nice day, everyone. Enjoy your day. Take it easy.